Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us today. My name is Helen McAvoy. I'm Director of Policy with the Institute of Public Health in Ireland and I'm going to be chairing today's session. I have a few opening slides to run through before we hear from our uh, webinar contributors who I'm going to be introducing shortly. Uh, but firstly, in terms of uh, just uh, instructions, um, I can scroll on my slides here. I can scroll on my slides here. Here we go next. Right. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, uh, if you could submit them on the question and answer tab on the bottom of your Zoom screen, a selection of questions will be put to the panel a bit later in the session and uh, others will be answered directly inside the thread. Um, at the end of the session, we'll provide a link and a QR code, code for the full report. That will be in the closing slides of the session. And after the event is finished, uh, we'll email you with an online link with a recording of the webinar, an evaluation form, and information on how to register for CPD points. So we do welcome feedback on, on the webinar and on the findings of the report. Um, and you can follow up with us um, on those in due course. So for those of you who are keen to engage with us on social media, uh, these are the hashtags uh, to use on Twitter and the Twitter handles of um, the Institute of Public Health, the uh, National University of Ireland Galway and the National Cancer Control Programme in the HSE. So without uh, further ado, it's my pleasure to firstly welcome and secondly introduce our speakers. Um, my first welcome is for Professor Saoirse McGowan. Saoirse works at the National University of Ireland in Galway. She's going to kick off um, the session a little bit later by talking us through the findings from the Health Behaviour and School Age Children Survey in Ireland. Uh, she and her team have been working very hard over the past 18 months to pilot these questions, refine them and roll them out in the survey and to do the data cleaning and analysis, a big job. Um, and I think that Ireland is one of the first HBSE participant countries to collect this, this uh, type of data. Uh, the second speaker today will be Dr. Triana McCarthy. Triana is a consultant in public health medicine. She's working with Ireland's uh, Cancer Control Programme. She's been very closely involved in the development of Ireland's first Skin Cancer Prevention Plan, which was published last year. And she's going to provide an update on Ireland's plans to protect children's skin from ultraviolet damage and share some of the opportunities and challenges to date in implementation of the plan. So uh, our third speaker is Craig Sinclair. Uh, Craig is joining us from Australia, which is rather late at night. So thank you, Craig. He's director of the World Health Organization Collaborative Center for uh, ultraviolet radiation, and I'm sure he'll be no stranger to the international skin cancer prevention community. Uh, we're very happy to have his perspective on what we're learning about children's exposures in Ireland and what we can learn from the Australian experience. So your host organization today is the Institute of Public Health. Um, just a few short words about, about who we are and what we do. Uh, the Institute of Public Health is an all-island organisation with offices in Dublin and Belfast. Our work supports the development of evidence-informed policies and programmes to enhance population health and address uh, health equity. Uh, this piece here just shows a snapshot of, of some of the work that we do in research and evidence review, policy analysis and evaluation, partnership working, um, training and communication. So uh, the report that, we're, that I'm going to be presenting today is really the, the fruits of, of partnership between um, IPH and these organisations, uh, National University of Ireland in Galway, which is the uh, Irish partner in the World Health Organisation Health Behaviour in School Age Children Survey and the National Cancer Control Programme. So we're spanning research policies, programmes, the whole lot. Um, the report is developed in the context of Ireland's Skin Cancer Prevention Plan, which Trina will be talking to a little later in the session. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of uh, the data sources in the report. We won't be able to cover everything uh, during the webinar. Um, 
we have uh, the first available data on child sun, sun safety behaviours, sunburn and sunbed use from the HBSC survey. We have some data from um, a survey of school children in Northern Ireland, which, which had some figures around children's attitudes to tanning, uh, perceptions of risk. We have some data from the Growing Up in Ireland survey around how children identify their own uh, skin type. Um, from the Healthy Ireland survey, we have some data on adult sun protection behaviours and sun bed use in the population aged 16 and older. From the National Cancer Registry in Ireland, we have some figures in relation to uh, trends in um, adult skin cancers in Ireland, uh, the location of melanomas on male and female bodies and so on. And from um, Met Erin, which is our uh, national meteorological service, we have some data on um, ultraviolet indices. These are actually uh, collated in Germany by the Deutsche Wetterdienst, um, but the data is, is collected by Metarian. So the uh, data that we have covers both children and adults and various different sort of aspects of um, the, the, the elements of risk. The new data that, that we're talking about today attempts to sort of paint a picture of the level and types of risk being posed to, to people's skin in Ireland in that very critical period of childhood and adolescence when we know that um, children's skin is more vulnerable to UV damage and we know that childhood sunburn and excess exposure in childhood can increase the risk of subsequent uh, skin cancer. We've used multiple data sets, which has allowed us to take a first look at risk from lots of different angles, from genetic angles, behavioral, environmental, as well as looking through the lens of gender and social class. The data are robust, originating from large representative survey data sets alongside quality approved commissioned data sets from government. Um, and the strength has been built on the strength of our partnership where, where we have teams working in research and in the, in the academic sector in policy and in, in the delivery of key programs and strategies in government. So the data reflects the words and understandings ultimately of the children themselves, which brings, I think, strengths, but also some weaknesses to the interpretation. And Saoirse will talk on that a little bit later. Um, some of the limitations that we came across in doing this work was a lack of, of data on, uh, on younger children and babies. Um, when, we, when we start to get data, we start to want more and more. <laughs> And there's always more information that we want in terms of the granularity, the detail around use of sunscreen versus use of factor 50 plus or you wearing a hat versus wearing a hat that covers the ears and neck and so on. We have, um, we're at a very early stage in understanding the sort of beliefs and attitudes and perceptions of children around risk, um, around uh, tanning um, and body image. So it ties in with a lot of other aspects around children's well-being. Um, and the uh, exposures that children have, both in the physical environment in terms of, say, the provision of shade or the sociocultural environment around body image, skin color, and so on. Um, so that just gives a, a broad overview of um, where we are in terms of the data. So we hope that the, the data will be useful in providing baseline estimates at the start of the skin prevention plan to see um, uh, whether improvements can be made to allow the Irish data to be compared internationally, um, to allow us to refine the survey variables, to make the questions um, uh, in a way that children can answer well and in a way that's meaningful for policies and programs and to be used to prioritize actions and target groups. For example, if we know that boys and girls, some safety behaviors are different, it gives us some information on how we might target those. Ultimately, um, the data could be used in terms of modeling to say if we can improve some safety behaviors by so much, what, what might we expect to see in terms of reductions in skin cancers subsequently um, and to help us identify data gaps and, and, and uh, respond to those. And more broadly, I think if, when we do, if the, the, at the, the line that ends all reports is more research is needed. And of course it is. Uh, but what this data does is it helps us formulate some of those key research questions, some of which may need to be answered through qualitative methods or other types of studies, provides evidence for advocacy. And I think it provides us um, some evidence that can be used to support youth voice and participation in the implementation of the strategy. So that is everything from me. I am now going to um, hand over to uh, Professor Sirshin McGowan, who's going to talk 
was through the findings from the HBSC survey. Thank you very much, Helen. I'm just going to share here. My presentation, I hope people can see that. Um, thanks for the introduction, Helen. And from the perspective of HBSC in Ireland and indeed the Health Promotion Research Centre in Galway, uh, we're delighted to have been partnering with such a range of bodies um, in this work. It's exactly what HBSC is designed uh, to do. And so it's been a privilege to work with you on this. I think you pointed out really well some of the potential and some of the limitations of the data I'm about to present. But I'll go through that um, as I speak. So what I want to do with the time I have is just give you a little bit of background about HBSC, what it is, uh, where the data come from, and the kind of methodology or approach that we use to data um, collection. And specifically in this case, look at some of the measures that we included in the most recent um, nationally representative survey around sun protection and UVR exposure. Then I'm going to provide some of the data itself around protective behaviours around sunburn or self-report of sunburn and sunbed use. And I'll finish up then with a look at some of the, the key points, some of the limitations and some acknowledgements, obviously. Um, and to start off, I think it's always important to acknowledge that we wouldn't have this data unless schools helped us. And particularly that parents and children uh, took part, gave consent and gave us um, their feedback. So what is HBSC? It stands for Health Behaviour and School Age Children. It's a pan-European and North American survey that takes place every four years. The last time in 2018 across 47 uh, separate uh, countries or regions. It's a network of researchers, approximately 400 researchers across 50 countries. Each of us in our own countries with policy and practice links exactly like the one that's being really showcased today. It was initiated in 1982 by four countries, not, not Ireland. We joined in 1994. So in Ireland, we're lucky we have um, six cycles of HBSC data collected. That's data collected from um, almost 50,000 children since 1998. So one of the things we're able to do is look at trends, although not in this subject area, because as you pointed out, this is the first time that data around these issues have been uh, collected, but we hope we'll be able to do so uh, in the future. In NUI Galway, at the Health Promotion Research Centre, we're celebrating at the moment our 25th year of being engaged with HBSC work and uh, doing our best to contribute to improving the lives of children in Ireland and internationally. So HBSC collects data by self-administered uh, questionnaires in the classroom with the assistance of schools, school principals, managements, and of course classroom teachers. The sample itself is stratified by geographical region. Initially, it, that was the old health boards, uh, but we've retained that sample structure uh, over time in order to ensure comparability. And the, the number of children in the sample are proportionate to those geographic regions. Overall, the HBSC study in Ireland has data from over 15,000 children, but today I'm going to be presenting data based on just over 10,000 children aged between uh, 10 and 17 from 254 primary and post-primary schools. This represents a response rate of 63% of invited schools and 84% of those students who were invited. Indeed, the level of refusal is very uh, low, most of the, uh, the non-engagement at the individual uh, student level is related to absence from school or being involved in some other school activity like sports, choir, uh, preparation for um, school events. So the data uh, pre I'm presenting today is taken from children who were in fifth class and sixth class in primary schools and in the first four or five years of post-primary school. So we omit leaving search students because they're very difficult um, to obtain in schools uh, for, for obvious reasons. And we have full ethical approval from the Human Research Ethics Committee in NUI Galway. 
In relation to the measures that we're presenting here around sun protection um, and UVR exposure, we did this work on foot of a request from the Institute of Public Health uh, to the Department of Health, Healthy Ireland, where we are funded from. And together we conducted a review of existing measures in other countries. And we're very thankful for the work of the IPH and the contribution of the IPH in that. We looked at epidemiological studies and intervention trials to, to identify what measures might be most appropriate for a study of this kind, which is a self-report study, um, and for children of, in these age groups. We looked uh, particularly at what um, the data from Northern Ireland, but also the key studies in places where there have these, been these interventions, such as Denmark and the USA and Australia. So within the HBSC, the HBSC study in 2018, we've assessed the extent to which children report using some kind of protection when they go out on a sunny day. And there were four key areas there, or five, um, whether they wore hats, whether they wore sunglasses, whether they wore clothes that cover arms and legs, whether they avoided the sun between 12 and 3, and whether they wore sunscreen. And as Helen has already alluded to, one of the limitations is that uh, we asked about any sunscreen and not sunscreen of a particular SPF um, level. Although I would have some concerns whether children would know what type of sunscreen, uh, particularly the younger children, uh, they were, uh, that was being applied to them or that they were using themselves. We also asked about experience of sunburn over the last 12 months and over their lifetime. Sunbed use over the last 12 months and lifetime, which we know um, in the Republic um, is supposed to be prohibited by the Public Health Sunbed Act in 2014. And for those children who, had, who did report having used a sunbed either last 12 months or lifetime, whether they had been, whether their age had been checked by the provider, whether they had been advised to use protective eyewear, whether they were given advice on their skin type and whether they were informed of the general health risks. So these set of core measures that we included were initially piloted um, in, across five schools as part of the, the general pilot work we would do for HBSC. And at that time they were piloted in younger children as well as the age group 10 to 17 that we're presenting on today. And we found at that point that really the younger children, the children in third and fourth class, eight to nine year olds uh, primarily, really didn't understand a number of the questions. And we determined that to ask these questions of those younger children wouldn't have been valid and, and potentially unethical. So I'm going to go ahead now and start to present some of the findings. Many of you have the report in front of you, the details of the, the data I'm presenting now are, can be found in the in the appendix of the report um, and some of the summary data is in the body of the report. So first of all, those children reporting, 10 to 17 year olds reporting the use or the wearing of sun hats or hats when they're out in the sun on a sunny day. We found here, I've presented the data in terms of whether they always do it, which is green for good, and um, sometimes which is blue and never, which is red. And I've presented the data here separately by gender, by age group, and by social class, where social class one to two is down at the bottom there, SC one dash two, they're the higher professionals and um, lower professional group. Overall, we see uh, pretty pro <laughs> quite a lot of red, here, these are children who never who report that they never wear a hat. In general, we find uh, significant differences between uh, boys and girls, where boys are more likely to wear hats than girls, between children in different age groups, where younger children are more likely to wear hats than older children, and differences across social class, where the higher social classes are more likely to report wearing sun hats. Now, these differences are statistically significant, but you'll see from the numbers, some of the, the, uh, the size of the differences aren't always that substantial. 
overall the message here is that over half of children never wear sun hats and that's the key point. In relation to sun, uh, the wearing of sunglasses, that's a lot more frequent as the report notes um, but we also find some um, gender differences here and they're, they're much more substantial. So girls are much more likely to wear sunglasses than boys and we find that across all the age groups. There is also a significant difference by age which is a lot less important than the gender difference but no social class difference here. So, so overall then sunglass use is a lot more frequent, especially more frequent than sun hat use. In relation to what we call protective clothing or clothing that covers the limbs, this is on a day when you go out or when the children are going out when it's sunny. Here we also see differences across gender, age and social class. Many of the differences are small, you see the difference there in gender is small. Because of the, the large sample size, over 10,000, some of these differences emerge as statistically significant, but actually the differences are marginal and not necessarily of any um, practical import. There is definitely an age difference here, or a difference across age groups, where um, older children are much more likely, or more likely, uh, to use protective clothing or to report the use of protective clothing uh, than younger children. And also the social class difference here, where those children who come from the, the lower socioeconomic groups or the lowest social classes are more likely to report wearing protective clothing. What uh, we're learning now is that the differences are not always in the same direction and the patterns across socio-demographic groups vary according to which protective measure we're talking about. In relation to avoiding being out in the sun between 12 and 3 p.m. on a sunny day, here we find more differences by age, gender and social class. And particularly boys here not avoiding being out in the sun in the middle of the day. 72.4% um, of boys overall between 10 to 17 saying they never avoid the sun at, during these times. So we've got a significant uh, gender difference there. There's also significant differences uh, by, by age group with the younger or with the older children more likely to, to uh, go out in the day during the middle of the day and differences by social class as well there, although they're less, um, less striking. Sunscreen use is really important and this is one of the areas where um, we've just asked about any sunscreen use so that's an important thing to remember when you're looking at these data. Here we find the preponderance of children reporting that they sometimes wear sunscreen. So a very a relatively low proportion, uh, particularly of girls saying they never wear sunscreen. Um, and a high proportion of girls, a relatively high proportion of girls saying that they always wear sunscreen on a sunny day. So girls more likely to wear sunscreen than boys here. And younger children more likely to wear sunscreen uh, always and, and sometimes than older children. We also find that children from social class groups are more likely to report as sunscreen use. So the differences across social class are smaller and of less practical importance. One of the ways uh, that we, we need to look at this is to look at the extent to which children are reporting multiple protective behaviours because it's not a single protective behaviour that's recommended by WHO but multiple behaviours and indeed in this kind of construct or, or this way of putting the data together it's important to recognise that the use of sunscreen is considered to be a measure of last resort and that the other types of protective uh, behaviour should come first. So here there's three columns of data screen, use of hat or protective clothing. And here we see that very high proportions of children are using at least one measure of protection. Now this is important because this indicates that the children are aware and their families are likely aware that some protection is required. So 
these high figures are figures that can be built on in any intervention activity. For those who are using at least three or five protection behaviours, they're the five that we've already, I've already presented on, the rates are well over um, 50%, around 60% overall, with some variation by age, gender and social class. That also gives us some level of comfort that needs to be built on, that children are also using multiple measures and are aware of, of that, the possibility and the, um, the appropriateness of that. A further level of protection is offered, I think, by the, percent, the, the percentages uh, presented in the final column, where none, these are the percentages of the children, uh, numbers of children who are using none of the protective behaviours. And these rates overall are about 3% with some variations, uh, particularly strong variation there by boys and girls, um, but very few children not using any protective behaviour ever. Again, this gives us something uh, to build on, I think. I want to move on now to talk about sunburn, which we know is a rather important predictor of um, lifetime uh, problems, uh, skin cancer problems. The data are presented here by gender for last summer, which in this case would have been summer uh, 2017, and over the lifetime. Important here, I think, are the very high proportions of children who are reporting over their lifetime having it been exposed to sunburn or having had sunburn three or more times, which is a key uh, factor for future risk. Around 65% of the children aged uh, 10 to 17 reporting they've had sunburn three or more times in their lifetime. Uh, there are uh, gender differences for last summer for girls, but uh, not over the lifetime. We look at this by age, it's unsurprising and totally predictable that older children will report having had more um, sunburn over their lifetime, they've had more life in order to have experienced that sunburn, but fewer differences um, by age or, or smaller differences by age uh, last summer. And then if we look at social class, we see that the proportion of children reporting sunburn or multiple sunburns is higher amongst those children of the higher social class, which we, um, we think, though we don't have evidence to say this, is likely due to a higher frequency of sun holidays or overseas holidays. Now we do know how many holidays uh, children have, but we don't know where those holidays are and whether they're in sunny places. But it's quite likely that families with more disposable income are more likely to leave Ireland for sunnier climes for holidays and that's part of the reason. Nevertheless, the differences are not huge and across all groups we've got a very high rate, as I said earlier, around 65% of these 10 to 17 year olds reporting sunburn in their lifetime or three or more times in their lifetime. And finally, I want to present some data on sunbed use. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, sunbed use of under 18s and all the children in this study are under 18 um, is prohibited. However, and, and the vast majority of children uh, never have used a sunbed. We don't know where they, those 3% who have used a sunbed have used them. It could be at home um, or it could be in a sunbed uh, parlour or a sunny, a sun, I don't know what they're called, sunning clinic, various names, which indeed was one of the problems uh, during our pilot was finding the right words to describe this activity. Obviously, many children had thought sunbed use was being a sun recliner in their back garden. So finding exactly the right words was a, a, fun, a fun activity. So rates of sunbed use um, are low, 3%, but they're very serious. And there are important um, economic, socioeconomic, socio uh, gender and age differences here. Girls are more likely than boys to report sunbed use of any type. Those in the higher social classes also more likely to report sunbed use in the last 12 months, which is slightly uh, different to um, some of the stereotypes that you might hear discussed. And, um, but no, no age differences. Uh, the differences, however, are small um, across any of the age groups. Important, I think, though, for even those, this 3% of children is low, 
remember we have a sample size of uh, over 10,000, is the extent to which children have been asked about these kinds of um, protective issues or checking issues when they go to use sunbed. So asked about their age, a number of children of course don't remember that, but a percent of that 3% report that they were asked every time about their age, so having that checked. The percentage being offered and told to use protective goggles, around 20%, being given advice on their skin type, and we know that most Irish children have the skin type um, that makes them particularly susceptible, and being told about the health risks at 16%. Again, there are differences by socio-demographic group, but those differences are generally small in size. Um, and interestingly, the higher social classes were least likely to be given um, such advice. So just in conclusion then, it's extremely important from the point of view of strategy and intervention that we recognise that lifetime exposure, this is self-reported lifetime exposure to sunburn is very high. About 65% of these children reporting that they've been sunburned three or more times in their lifetime. Sunbed use is rare but requires public health action, public health and policy action both together and integrated um, with due recognition I think or we think of the potential um, to do with disadvantaged groups. The use of sunscreen and sunglasses are the most frequently reported protective behaviours and reports of multiple protective behaviours which is what is recommended by WHO vary by groups. The important point here is that the vast majority of children are using some protective, from a preventive and, and health promotion point of view at least, the important point is that it, the vast majority of children are using some protective behaviour which we believe is something that can be built on in interventions as they're developed. We do, ha however, have some very important gaps in our data. We have no information on sunburn severity. That's a difficult question to ask children about, particularly in retrospect. We did give a definition. It was that the sun, that their skin was uh, red and, um, and it hurt for a number of hours after exposure to the sun but that's not a quantitative uh, measure. We have no data on sunscreen SPF or the quality of the sunscreen that's been applied or whether it's being reapplied appropriately. And as Helen pointed out in her introduction, we have no data on children under 10, partially from this data source, because all our data is self-report, uh, one of the barriers was developing questions that were that we could, we could stand over in terms of the, their validity with younger children. I just want to acknowledge, um, as I finish up, the work of Dr. Andras Coulter, who did uh, the preliminary analysis on all of this, and other members of our team, Eva Gavin and Larry Walker, who also uh, contributed. And to thank, as, as I started out, the children and the parents who, con who um, consented and participated in the work, and all the schools and school managements. I said there are 254 schools in Ireland, uh, in the Republic, who facilitated data collection and, and simply we couldn't do any of our work without them. A number of um, statutory or groups within the HSC, statutory groups and some NGOs who have contributed as partners and developed the measures and so on. And uh, I want to thank each of those sincerely. Also encourage you, if you'd like to keep up to date with HBSC work in Ireland or internationally to make contact with us and join our mailing list, have a look at our website, follow us on Twitter and so on. Um, and you're all very welcome to join us if, you, if you're interested. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Saoirse, for your uh, presentation. Um, I'm fully aware of the huge amount of work that goes into piloting those variables and rolling them out in the real world and uh, coming to those figures at the end. Um, uh, so thank you very much for uh, going through those and making it so clear for everyone to understand what's in, what, what 
uh, the variables are, why they were chosen, and what the key findings are. Um, we did have a, a, some small um, connection issues um, in relation to the, to the sound, uh, but I'm sure that we will have the slides and the, the recording available um, afterwards. Um, just a few reminders before I move on to our, our next speaker. Um, please do submit your, your questions under the Q&A tab um, on Zoom. If you can't see it, you sometimes if you hover your um, cursor over the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A option come up. Please do submit your, your questions as they occur to you through the presentations. We'll be uh, collating those and putting them to uh, the panel later in the session. So we'd love to see some, some questions um, coming in. Uh, for those of you who have joined the webinar a little bit later, also to remind you that uh, a link to the full report and a QR code for uh, accessing that report will be avail made available in the, in the closing slides. And um, we will also be contacting uh, attendees after the event with a recording and evaluation and um, information relating to uh, CPD. So um, please send us in some questions under the Q&A. We're really interested to hear what is uh, occurring to you in terms of the, the findings of the, the report to date. Um, if I could just maybe briefly reflect on, on some of the points that, that Saoirse has made before we move on to our, our next speaker. Um, I think the, the pattern that came out did seem to point to perhaps an over-reliance on sunscreen. And as you said, using that as perhaps the first line of defense rather than using other sun protection behaviors. Um, and Craig may have some perspective on, on learning from that in Australia. Um, also, I think the gender patterns are, are very interesting. Uh, perhaps we also see um, risk taking uh, rising in some extent across lots of behaviours when we get to adolescence and, and maybe that's, that's a challenge across a number of behaviours. Um, in terms of sunburn severity, it was very difficult to have any measures of that in the report. We sought data from hospital services about A&E attendances among uh, children with, with sunburn, but because the numbers were so low in some years, it was very difficult to come to an estimate. But I understand that some of the Australian data has shown that teenagers are overrepresented among A&E attendances for severe sunburn. So we are looking at a, at a sort of higher risk group. Um, and in relation to uh, skin type, um, the estimates that we have from self-report in Irish teenagers is that over half of them are Fitzpatrick type 1 and 2, uh, which to the dermatologists and, and skin cancer specialists out there will make sense. So just to remind you again about the uh, Q&A, please do submit your questions under the Q&A tab and um, we will look forward to um, putting those to the panel a bit later in the session. So I'm now going to move on to uh, uh, Trina McCarthy, who's going to talk us through her work in the National Cancer Control Programme on Ireland's in Cancer Prevention Plan. So, Trina, welcome and off you go. Thanks very much, Helen, and good morning to everyone. Um, so, as been mentioned already, the, the report being launched today was in response to a recommendation in the National Skin Cancer Prevention Plan. So, today what I want to do is to give you an overview of the overall plan itself and the progress made to date, and I'll, I'll you know, focus particularly then on, on children and, and young people, given the, the population we're discussing today. Get the slides moving. Um, and just as many of you will know, melanoma is the most serious form of skin cancer and because it can spread to the rest of the body and lead to death. And just to show you the Irish figures and uh, what we are projecting within Ireland, that's, uh, you know, both in men and in women, it's the fourth most common invasive cancer. So we see over a thousand people each year that are diagnosed with melanoma. And even more concerning is the fact that, you know, our projections are that this will increase to, you know, that it will double really by 2045. So it really is a major area of concern. And then while non-melanoma skin cancer, while it's less serious and, you know, it's, it's very unlikely to spread, it does still, you know, require, um, it requires treatment, you know, can cause distress and disfigurement. And again, just the, you know, the quite dramatic rise that we see um, that's predicted over the next decade really makes this such a, an area of concern for us. 
and this need to make a kind of concerted national effort around um, you know tackling these rising skin cancer rates and um, that was called out in our national cancer strategy from um, for the 2017 to 2026 period and specifically called out um, the need for such a skin cancer prevention plan and um, you know, it also said that what we should, you know, how we should address that was to use the Healthy Ireland approach, which would be within Ireland our approach to um, sort of a cross-governmental approach, but also tapping into um, communities and having the vision that, um, if I can quote it, you know, we'd have an Ireland where everyone can enjoy physical and mental health and well-being to their full potential, where well-being is valued and supported at every level of society and is everyone's responsibility. So. It's really about looking at the resources we already have within society and and saying that this isn't an issue for you know just for the health services it's about you know something across society and how we can influence and um really you know tackle everyone's risk in relation to skin cancer so to briefly mention just the development of it i mean it was very much following a review of you know the evidence that's there and what other successful programs um, are in place. So particularly looking at the SunSmart campaign and also learning from the experience of our closest neighbours in, um, in Northern Ireland as well. And also looking at what efforts were already underway in Ireland and linking with the various partners that are, were already very much engaged in skin cancer prevention, having a very broad kind of consultative approach. And I mean, the plan itself really just outlines how we'd, you know, how we'd aim to improve awareness of both UV risk and UV protective behaviours, but also encourage adoption of those behaviours and also how we can monitor the impact of those as well, which is important. And in keeping with the National Cancer Strategy recommendation, there were four particular target populations that were called out. So they were children, outdoor workers, and um, those who partake in outdoor recreation and sunbed users. So knowing that it's an issue for the general population at large, that these were key target areas. And to, I suppose, focus on children, first of all, why? I mean, for a lot of things, we look at as children and how we can influence them because we want them to sort of have, um, you know, the healthy lifestyle behaviours ingrained in them from a young age. And we're trying to establish habits for life, um, notwithstanding the rebellion that Helen mentioned that may happen in teenage years. But, you know, that they will um, have certain things that will become habits and that, they, that will stay with them. But then also there's a very important fact that they have quite vulnerable skin and that skin damage at a young age can have such a long lasting impact. So the fact that we know that, you know, if you have a you know, number of incidents of severe sunburn as a child, that that can, you know, two to four times increase your risk of melanoma in, in, in later life. So it's, you know, it's the long lasting impact of, um, you know, both sunburn and, and your kind of cumulative exposure to UV as well, both being important and that's, you know, tackling those from a young age, I think are, are really important. And in terms of the priority populations that are mentioned here, when we're thinking of children and young people, other than kind of the outdoor workers group, um, I'm not sure how many people do paper rounds anymore, definitely not during the pandemic, but among children, you know, the, the areas of out, outdoor recreation and sunbed users would also still still apply, you know. So um, we still need to consider, obviously, we want to encourage children to be outdoors and take part in physical activity, both, you know, for their physical and, and mental well-being to be outdoors. But we need to do that while also ensuring that their skin is protected from excessive UV. So, you know, there's a huge overlap between the priority populations there. And I won't go into sunbed users too much today. I think it's been covered very well in what Saoirse has presented that, um, you know, we know that it's, it's prohibited in young people, but from this report and others, we can see that there is still sunbed use there. So um, even though it's prohibited in under 18, you know, what can we do to um, both tackle that in terms of the availability, but also the kind of desire for tanning that must underline that. And that's again, something important for us to consider. So in terms of our overall approach to kind of the overarching message that, that we're um, giving through the, um, the campaign that, that's as a result of this plan, I mean, our overarching message is to use the, the SunSmart code of the five S's, which I'll go through now. And we've incorporated this in with the, the Healthy Ireland branding as a kind of a recognisable source of information on the health and well-being that the, that the population are, are, are now familiar with. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on, this, um, on this screen, 
to look at the what the five messages are and then just to sort of um, think back to what Sirisha has shown us today and, and you know what we can learn as to um, how behaviours are currently in, in young people in Ireland and, and I think it's really really useful then to be able to focus on where we need to target so I'll pick out the so two areas which we've mentioned which would be use use of sunscreen and and use of um, sunglasses and they're the two areas really where there's a you know, reasonably high adoption of of those behaviors and, and it actually matches quite well as well with what was in the Healthy Ireland survey among older people well from age 15 up that they are the two things that people do tend to do more so they do tend to use sunscreen and do tend to use um, sunglasses um, but that they tend to forget maybe about the other three measures. So that's that's something for us to focus on. And um, we do have the gaps, um, as was mentioned already, in terms of knowing how people are using a sunscreen. So yes, it is meant to be kind of the last area of or the last the last resort really. It's really meant to be just on your exposed areas of skin. But again, do people are people using it appropriately and reapplying it, etc. Um, so there are some gaps there that we don't know about. But the other three areas in terms of slipping on clothing, using long sleeves clothing, for example, to protect your arms. And, um, you know, we've seen today that, you know, it's only one in two in general that we're adopting that. And, you know, again, that fits with the older age groups as well. But, you know, what can we do to, to influence that, particularly in terms of parents advising their children, but also children's willingness to do that. Wearing a wide brimmed hat in terms of, again, protecting the, the hat, the ears, the neck, you know, how can we influence that? How can we make it more acceptable? You know, how can we influence that behavior? And, and we've looked at things like gender um, differences here as well. So, um, you know, there, there might be very specific things we can target and work with um, young people to, to see how we can address that. And particularly looking at shade, I'll talk about the Irish context in a minute in terms of the time of year and the time of day, but when the UV rays are highest and people staying out of direct sunlight, that's something again, which you know we've seen is quite low take up um, among young people. That, you know that they reported here, so it was only about one in three, and it was less likely in, in the older groups. And similarly in adults, it's it's quite similarly low. So that message about actually just staying out of the sunlight or getting some shade or sitting under a tree or whatever, um, if you're outdoors during that time, um. That's something which, again, I think this report has really highlighted for us. So in terms of the behaviours that have been reported in this for, for this age group of children, I think it really has kind of selected out areas that we need to focus on in terms of what protective behaviours are there. And then, you know, some, some additional areas in terms of certain things that might be parent driven in the younger age groups and maybe not sustained as you get into teenage years. And if there's there's other means of motivating children there, I think, and also very importantly, some of the socioeconomic um, differences that are here in are there particular kind of strategies that we can adopt that can you know, make these behaviors um, more accessible to, to people and, and see how we can dig into that a little deeper. Um, I also feel obliged to mention the Irish context in our own climate and the fact that you know, not every summer's day is a beautiful sunny day by the beach and, and the fact that we can have such damp wet winters and springs and autumns and sometimes summers as well so it is you know it is part of the mix when, when we're talking to people about sun that we have to be conscious that you know people get excited about a sunny day and and um you know you can't really blame them for wanting to to, <laughs> to get outside and make the most of it um and it's trying to have that balance of Yes, it's good to be outdoors. We want people to be outdoors in, in any weather. It's good for your physical and mental well-being for lots of reasons. But just keeping that in mind that you need to, to protect your, your sun as well or protect your skin um, from the damage uh, from the UV rays as well. And in terms of our kind of, I suppose, calendar during the year and the fact that, you know, the UV rays really aren't that strong over the, um, the winter time and that it's really from April to um, September that we know that the UV index goes above three, so it can cause damage to your skin. And the sort of da their daily reports um, that you can watch live from Met Erin in terms of actually measuring that particular day from um, Valencia in Kerry and this is just one of the days last week which um, you know it was it was a cloudy enough day you know it wasn't the um, wasn't a beautiful 
um, summer's day in Ireland, but still, you know, quite it's quite consistently seen that, you know, from sort of 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock that you do see that the UV index does get up above 3 and even where there's cloud cover that, you know, so much of the UV rays can get through cloud cover anyway. So people might think, oh, it's a cool enough day, it's not the nicest, you know, um, and they go out and about their, their day without using any skin protection at all, whereas, you know, there can be damage caused to, to your skin during that period. So I think that's something we really need to focus on as a consistent message, you know, that it doesn't have to be the sunniest day. That's just the time period. Get into the habit of protecting your skin um, and, you know, particularly your, you want your children to be outside and playing, but just to make it part of the routine that, you know, once you get kind of into April and on to September, that that time of day is is when skin can be damaged and to, to follow those five S's during that time and to remember that even coming through our Irish cloud, you can still damage your skin. And just, I, suppose, I want to emphasize as well that, you know, I don't want to oversimplify, I suppose, behavior change and that I'm really conscious that it's not just about telling people what to do um, and that it's not just giving them the knowledge that and in this strategy that we need to think about, you know, how we can create environments that, that make those behaviors, um, you know, easy and kind of second nature as best we can. So considering all of those kind of environmental things, um, and then, you know, also understanding that we, you know, we come up with messages that are acceptable to people and, and have ways of motivating people and influencing them and, and having, having it appropriate to those populations as well. So I think that's where this report is really, really useful as, you know, a start in that as to what children are and aren't doing and, and it'll start, you know, to help us open that conversation with them. So I'll bring through just in terms of some of the pieces we've progress to date in terms of looking at the sort of regulators within the um, the younger childhood settings. So particularly for early learning um, and the care settings, we do have agreement that when the the next version of the quality and regulatory framework will incorporate, you know, some smart policies that that we can um, you know show their evidence base and that they will they will put those into the regulatory framework. So that would be a very useful way of, of ensuring those measures are you know, get into all of those those settings. And sort of an early win for us was in the um, the universal design guidelines were being updated for early learning and care settings, and they did. Um, you did manage to get inclusion of, of the, um, the rationale for and examples of provision of shade. So how in these settings, you know, can you, can you put shade in, um, in place, you know, within your environment and, and I suppose it was both having that there in the design guidelines so that they, the settings would consider it and then also it's been incorporated into um, some other ways I'll show you in terms of, you know, educating the people using those or the people working within those facilities as well um, to understand you know, the, the importance of some smart policies around you know, hat wearing etc. if children are going in and outdoors but having that, that shade outdoors um, option I think was a really um, important one for us. And then in terms of again first of all looking at particularly at younger children and how do you influence the parents and the carers and the educators um, We've had a lot of initial discussions with those working on the first five strategy, which we for parents of under fives and how, again, we can influence them and get messages to them from, you know, really from birth to incorporate, um, you know, skin protection in their, in their um, sort of regime in terms of caring for their child and having that sort of incorporated from very early on. And similarly, what I mentioned about influencing the, the educators and those working in childcare settings, there's a Healthy Ireland Smart Star program where they do a lot of um, educational sessions with those working in the sector. And um, in terms of skin protection, it's been, our approach has been to incorporate it into, for example, you know, when they're talking about the importance of outdoor play that you put beside that, how you protect the child's skin and um, what policies you can put in place in your early year setting to help to make that work and similarly the <clears throat> the National Childhood Network has also looked at things such as um, resources for parents as well <clears throat> excuse me and 
you know, that if we develop things with them for parents, they would be very much, um, you know, a means of communicating that and reinforcing those messages with them, um, with parents. And similarly, TUSLA then as our regulator of the childcare sector have been very open to communicating those kind of messages with people. When you look at older children, I mean, in terms of the, as again, the actual um, education sector, um, Aster, which would be the early childhood curriculum, are, are open to incorporating um, resources into their curriculum. And then there's also Skullnet, which would be for both primary and secondary, thus you can have, if we develop school resources, so whether it's, um, you know, lesson plans for children or whether it's um, means of schools to look at becoming a Sun Smart School, that there is a network there for being able to disseminate that out to the, um, the school network and that they would be open to that. And then I suppose it's not just about schooling then either, that there are other environments. So, um, I mean, in terms of the other structured environments that we've linked in with would be particularly around, um, you know, sports and the clubs, etc., that children would be um, involved in. So we've had initial discussions with Sport Ireland, who would be sort of the, um, in, in terms of all the national governing bodies, would feed in through Sport Ireland. So they would be very much open to sort of communicating messages and best practice out through the different national governing bodies, getting things into coaching materials and directly influencing how summer camps, etc., cetera, are, are delivered. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there. And I think we just need to um, you know, work on what is the message and the approach we want to take and that we have a lot of willing partners there um, ready to work with us. But then that there's also a lot of work still to be done in relation to um, sort of the unstructured recreational activities, I suppose, and the, you know, the local authorities and the, um, the other kind of environments children would be within and, you know, how we can influence their exposure and things such as, you know, your walkways, your parks, your beaches, etc. And again, that's something very much through the Healthy Ireland approach that we can influence. And as with the key area underpinning a lot of this was, how will we be able to focus, you know, how can we focus now on, on engaging with children and young people themselves and how to involve them um, in the kind of identification and design of behaviour change strategies. And um, this report has given us a lot of information on which particular behaviours to target, as well as giving us a, a baseline against which to monitor it. Um, and we had agreed with um, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs have a really excellent approach to, um, you know, developing strategies in conjunction with young people and consulting with them and involving them in the development. So that was something we had hoped to do around, um, around this time of year. So to involve um, children from that kind of 10 to 17 year um, age group in the development of, you know, what, you know, what would actually change your behaviour, you know, if you were to wear a hat, what, you know, how, how should we go about that? And, and this information would be a very good way of, of starting that conversation. Um, and unfortunately, like a lot of things um, that have happened this year, COVID-19 got in the way of that. So it was, you know, not just the fact that there was a lot of diversion of the public attention away from other, um, public health needs, etc., but also just the, the absolute logistics of bringing a group of young people together from around the country at this time of the year isn't something that's, that's feasible. And also the fact that you tend to use schools as a means of recruiting children. And we all know the children haven't been in school for, for quite some time. So it kind of scuppered our plans. So, um, but at the same time, I think it's, you know, it's something that we're, we're not forgetting about and we just need to think about, well, how can we do this? And then we, like, many other things we just might have to do it in a slightly different way. So it's it's staying very much at the top of the agenda. Um, but also, I suppose while mentioning COVID-19, I also think it's important to think about the, the context in terms of what impact it may have had on lifestyles currently. So um, in one sense, when children are at schools, we think, we, you know, that they are, um, they are sort of in out of the sunlight for a certain length of time, etc. But um, you know, they could be outdoors an awful lot more currently, or, or maybe they're not outdoors at all. We want them to be outdoors, but, you know, we need to kind of incorporate that into our messages as, as well. And we've mentioned foreign holidays earlier. And again, you know, that's something that's going to be less of an issue this year in terms of people going off to, to hotter countries. But at the same time, then it's an opportunity to really focus on the message that, you know, even if you stay in Ireland, 
you can still damage your skin with Irish sun and, and you know, take this year as, as the time to, to focus on that. Um, so like anything, we have a, a new normal to work with. Um, but even with, with COVID-19 and people being at home, there are still very important messages to get out there. So just to kind of start to sum up then, I mean, our next steps really are to take the information from this report and see how we can have a more targeted approach for this particular group. Um, to really rethink and come up with a means of involving children in the development of resources and strategies and hopefully develop new ways that we can influence children's behaviours I think it be a very exciting time. And then also to continue the work that we have in terms of developing the overall resources and public campaign and the communications networks um, and the partnerships that have been, um, been developed and to use this information again as a baseline and also then to you know be able to monitor and evaluate the impact that it has on behaviours in this group. And then finally just to mention some of it, like to acknowledge the work of some of the key partners in our um, skin cancer prevention implementation steering group with quite a number of people from the government health, health sector and the charitable and voluntary sector and our own lay representative Bernadette Rice as well and, and just to acknowledge their commitment to skin cancer prevention. They're a great group to, to work with. And then on behalf of that steering group, just to thank the, um, both the Institute of Public Health and NUIG uh, for the publication of the report today, which is uh, very much welcome. And thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Trina. It's really um, so interesting to get an insight into the work of strategy implementation and the challenge of translating the findings from data and research into policies and programs. So thank you very much for uh, everything there on the, the presentation. Um, thank you also to our attendees who are starting to send in their uh, questions. Uh, once one starts, the rest will follow. So I do continue to send in your, your questions. Uh, we'll hopefully address some, if not all of them, within the, the panel session a little bit later. Um, I think one of the things that really impresses me about the, the Skin Cancer Prevention Plan um, is the, um, the way in which it's trying to integrate with other policies and other public health messaging and also with regulation in settings where children tend to play, go to school and so on. So I think um, um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll start to see some, some returns from that and improvements in, in the, the frequency of sun safety behaviours into the future. Uh, so without uh, too much delay, I'm going to hand over to uh, Craig Sinclair, who is uh, joining us, as I said, from the other side of the world, uh, where it's a lot hotter than Ireland. Um, you're probably looking at that UV index graph and going, oh, <laughs> yes. looks cold there. <laughs> <laughs> looks like uh, Melbourne in winter. <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly with the, uh, the very hot weather that you had uh, late last year as well, and uh, in, 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 in this year as well. So. Um, and the, the heat wave experience must have been really, uh, mm. really something. So um, I'm now going to hand over to, to you, Craig. And uh, just a last reminder for our attendees, please get your uh, questions in uh, in the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes so that we can organize our questions for the panel. Okay, thank you very much, Craig, over to you. Thank you, Helen, and welcome everyone. It's delighted to present to you. Um, I, I had the good fortune to be in um, Ireland and Dublin at the guest of the Irish Cancer Society a couple of years ago, so I feel very privileged to um, be invited back there, even if uh, in a virtual context, so it's terrific. Um, so I've got a, a, a big brief, as you can see by the title of my slides there, um, to present in a very short period of time, but I hope that it will give an opportunity to provide some insights into what we know works well in the context of skin cancer prevention, not just within the Australian context, but also what we've learned internationally. So let's start with the international context. And I'm just gonna show and reflect on um, this data. And I, I, it, it tells, I think, an important story. Uh, Katrina presented the projections of melanoma for Ireland, which I have up here in the, the top right-hand corner. Um, and what I have um, presented here in terms of the broader slide is predicted uh, melanoma incidents across three moderate to high prevalence countries, the UK being one of them. 
the the age standardised rate in um, in Ireland at the moment, the best I, I I could see in the data I collected, is around twenty, which is not um, too dissimilar in terms of the prediction um, that we were wanting uh, that UK is at the moment. And I guess the reason why I presented this data is that a lot of people talk about skin cancer prevention and melanoma, the burden of melanoma within the Australian context to say that this is an Australian issue. Well, the, what you can see there in the Australian data is that the rates are starting to fall and they're, they're falling in particularly younger age groups who have had a lifetime exposure to the SunSmart message. And so really within the next 10 years, as we see rates in Australia falling, and the continued rise um, in projected increase in melanoma incidence in the United Kingdom. And as you can see from the, the graph up there that Katrina presented as well, um, in Ireland, um, we can see that while there won't be a convergence of lines, um, the disparity between the, the various countries in terms of impact of melanoma um, is not going to be overly significant as time goes on. So what, what that essentially means, I mean, the, the story that that tells to me is, is quite simple. We're, we're going to have uh, rising melanoma rates in Ireland, um, unless we're going to see little if any improvements in sun protection behaviour, we're certainly going to see an increased burden in terms of melanoma incidence. That's quite obvious from the, from the data that we're seeing. Um, when we've got incidents rising in men in Ireland around 4% and 2% in women year on, year on, um, we're not only going to see this rising incidence, but we're also going to see rising costs to the public health system. And uh, this problem of skin cancer for Ireland and for many other countries, uh, developing co developed countries, is, is going to continue to be a, a major public health problem. I'm just going to share with you um, where we've seen some evidence of effectiveness and, and first of all looking at it from a global perspective and some of these campaigns will be very familiar with you. Um, to the far left is the campaign run by C CRUK, we have your, uh, the Irish Cancer Society's campaign there, um, to the right the Danish campaign and then we have the Sunwise and the EPA in the United States. What's been interesting is, I mean, certainly in the US and the UK context, what we have seen is that even as a result of those campaign efforts, there's not been significant changes in behaviour um, in that context um, in terms of sunburn rates or indeed in significant changes in um, hat wearing or sunscreen use. And that's largely because they haven't had that long term and significant. Uh, community-wide intervention of some significance. So there's been quite a lot of that campaign activity around, but there's very few countries where we can really point to successful public health interventions in relation to skin cancer. The Danish one there is um, uh, an ex exception to that in the European context. And I think they've had uh, success in changing both behavior and attitudes um, and because they've been having a, a campaign uh, which has been sustained over quite a long period of time which has high public awareness. So there is success to point to um, in Europe and it's not just an Australian and New Zealand um, context that I'd like to highlight. In Australia we I, I need to obviously talk a little bit about um, my and our experience in skin cancer prevention and share what some of the learnings are from that. I think it's important to start to reflect on where we all started. This is a, a great slide I love showing because it's reflective of the times when we started our skin cancer prevention efforts in the 1980s where the desire for a, a very dark tan was highly desirable and as you can see the, the the couple on the left who have a uh, what would be considered a socially more socially desirable tan these days were considered very much undesirable um, back in the 1980s. So it does reflect um, 
quite a significant shift in attitudes from that time as a result of a significant efforts in public health in this area. We've also had great success in the primary schools area and that's been a big focus for us. We now have 90% of Victorian primary schools are SunSmart, which what that means is that they're committed to a school policy um, and that policy means that there has to be a no hat play in shade environment. So no kid is allowed to play outside unless they're wearing a hat between the times of the year when the UV index would peak above three. There has to be a commitment to shade in the school grounds and there has to be sun protection taught within the curriculum. Those are the sort of three basis things to enable a sun smart school to be accredited. So we're really proud that we now virtually would not have a primary school who would not be practicing this type of behavior. We've also seen some really good and positive changes in the sun protective environment where shade structures are common over playgrounds there would not be a public health pool, swimming pool that would not have shade over the, at least the toddler part of the pool um, in most states of Australia. So we are seeing some that, those very positive changes there as well. And we've had the context of having 30 years of media campaigns, which have been financed largely through the Victorian state government, who have enabled us to have a high public profile. And this has been instrumental in terms of helping to provide a broader context for some of those other settings approaches to work effectively. If people are aware of the message and understand the importance of it, then it really helps to reinforce changes in practice at the setting level. I'm also uh, really, it's also important to touch on the legislative or the policy environment that's underpinned this work as well. So uh, sunscreen above an SPF 30 is tax free in the Australian context. So it has no um, GST or VAT applied to it. Um, sun protection items are a tax deduction, so people can claim that, who are outdoor workers can claim that as part of their, their tax return. Occupational health and safety laws require workers to be protected, so there is an onus of responsibility on employee, employers to protect their staff, and it's also enshrined in prison and common law. One thing I'm really proud about what we have achieved is an outright ban of all commercial sunbeds um, right across Australia and we've had that in effect since 2015. So there is, um, there is no commercial sunbeds available, um, they're not available to be sold nor they're not allowed to be advertised. Um, people can still purchase them for private use but that market is um, incredibly small. And it was very interesting looking at your data. While the use of sunbeds was quite small, what it was clearly showing though is that those who were getting entry were not being asked of their age. They, they weren't checking their skin type. And from that was exactly what we were experiencing as well. And it was that data which was very powerful for us to um, advocate and inform um, ministers to enable this type of change to occur. Why, why the ban worked? Um, we had the government making a very clear statement that uh, they were going to ban this and it was going to be a two year transition period. Um, we've had very strong public awareness, of the dangers associated with sunbed use. And I know this has also been um, the case in Ireland. The government was very good. They employed private detectives to literally follow up um, the advertising that was occurring on trading sites like eBay, Gumtree and other sites where these services were being advertised. And we had a very low resistance to combat the ban. And what was probably most remarkable was when the ban took effect, um, there was very little outcry um, because the industry were not capable of essentially organising a butcher's picnic. They really could not organise amongst themselves a, a significant force to counter the public health aspect of it. So we, we know based on um, some very recent publication that 
that has just put out that I was fortunate to be involved in, but the banning of commercial sunbeds um, in Australia has been expected to avert almost 30,000 melanomas over a person's lifetime. So it has been a really remarkable impact and, and one which I think the more we can do to advocate around the world, um, the better that will be in terms of saving lives. One thing, just in terms of evaluation, um, we've been monitoring our skin cancer prevention efforts since 1987. We've been in the field every three years where we've been following uh, people up on, um, on the Monday morning following their weekend exposure and asking them questions around their sun protective behavior and sunburn rates. And as this data shows over a course of four years, we've seen, um, continued increase in the use of maximal sun protection, which is essentially more than three elements of sun protection and a decline in sunburn rates. The rates may not look remarkable in terms of effect, but um, it, it is significant in terms of what that um, has happened and we're expecting it to continue to track in the way that it's going. So what do we know is effective in skin cancer prevention, not just within the Australian context, but also what we know internationally? I have to say that there is a multitude of skin cancer frameworks and guidance. We have a very good understanding of what we know needs, what we need to do. Just to give you some examples, this has been going back since, um, since this is 2002, this is the CDC guidelines on sun protection. And what is written there is not too dissimilar in terms of what we're talking about today. There's been guidelines in um, Canada since 2006. We've had the NICE guidelines there, 2011. Um, the Northern Ireland had, were very bold and developed a 10 year strategic plan. So I'd love to know um, how that's progressed since that was first uh, released in 2011. Um, we've had multiple guidelines in Australia, in New South Wales, in Victoria, my home state. We've had uh, the Melanoma Task Force here um, or in the United Kingdom. Um, we've had the Community Guide, which was published in 2016, which I'll talk about shortly. The US Surgeon General's report and obviously um, your report, which was released um, only last year. And what was reassuring in many respects is that you know, your current plan focuses on young people, outdoor workers and leisure settings. And that certainly is where the evidence seems to point. So what I'm truly trying to say here is we actually know what needs to happen in relation to sun protection. We, we understand what motivates behavior, um, but we, we just need the, um, the commitment to be able to fund and sustain it over the long term. Many of you who've been working in skin cancer prevention would be well aware of these guidelines. And I, I think it's, it's really important to focus on that um, where we know the evidence works in skin cancer prevention is it works in childcare, it works in outdoor um, occupational and recreation and tourism settings, primary and middle schools, um, uh, also showing very strong effectiveness. So your work that you're doing in Ireland focusing on young people, outdoor workers and leisure settings certainly sits within the context where the strength of evidence of RCT trials have shown good effect in terms of seeing real changes in behaviour that has an effect in terms of reducing skin cancer. What um, my version of all that is what else is needed and I think the picture really, which has enabled success in Australia, but it's important within the context of, of Ireland, is that we need continuity of funding investment um, to enable that sustainable effort, the sustainable public messaging, the uh, effort in the settings that we need that we know we need to work, that multi-component interventions with strong media, um, including paid media and um, unpaid media. So that multi-component means that there's broad education plus settings approaches. And of course, uh, incredibly important is that research 
and evaluation, underpinning and monitoring the work. So you know whether you're making a difference. And this is really important to measure, not only whether the campaigns or the effort you're doing is making a difference, but it's really important to be able to feed that information back up to government to make sure that they can see the value of what the work is doing, or if it's not working, what you need to do else to make it happen. So in summing up uh, within the Irish context, I mean, one thing I, I haven't touched on yet is really the economic benefits and that's been very clear in Australia and I'm sure there's opportunities there in, in Ireland as well to, to know what that return on investment is. But I do want to make the point based on that, as I mentioned before, based on current trends, the human and financial burden of skin cancer is only going to get significantly worse. So within the Australian context, for every dollar we spend on um, skin cancer prevention, we know that we get three dollars um, in return. We know it for it costs ten dollars to to per person uh, in Australia to treat skin cancer. We know it costs about thirty cents per person uh, per capita to actually run prevention. Prevention continues to be incredibly good value and not just within the Australian context but where that economic analysis has been done within Europe has also shown strong returns on investment and of course um, we're also saving lives which is far more important as well. Uh, the other second point I want to make is that um, we, we're not going to see changes in behaviour without that long-term investment in multi-component community-wide effort. That graph is very clear. It is rising uh, for men. It's 4% per annum, women 2%. That's compounding. Um, so the rates are increasing. We know we need that, um, that long-term investment to really make a difference going forward. And finally, um, I know and having had the opportunity to be engaged with quite a number of you who are working in the area of trying to look at further restrictions or indeed bans of sunbed use within Ireland, um, I certainly encourage your efforts. Um, I guess the, the real take home message from the Australian experience was that the backlash in the context from community sentiment um, was not significant and certainly nowhere near as significant as it would have been when Ireland first um, banned smoking in hotels. Um, there is not a huge force fighting against us here. The evidence is very clear that our efforts to ban sunbed use, um, to eliminate them entirely is achievable and will bring really significant returns in terms of public health benefit going forward. So on that note, um, I, I'd just like to share um, my final slide for my Twitter handle. Obviously, I'm very proud that um, I uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of, of uh, the land that I sit on here in Australia, um, particularly in the context of Black Life Matters, but um, uh, I want to acknowledge that as well. So I'll leave it on, on that and have it back over to you, Helen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Craig. It's really just so beneficial to hear about how far you've come in Australia. Um, obviously, you've been um, on this journey, you got on this journey around skin cancer prevention uh, very early in the, in, the, in the 1980s. And uh, it's, it's really important for us to sort of learn from all of that uh, experience. Um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So thank you very much. It was a really good, uh, interesting presentation and uh, lots, to, uh, lots for us to uh, reflect on in Ireland. I just wanted to pick up on one uh, point in relation to the uh, Northern Ireland uh, Skin Cancer Prevention Plan. Um, there was a midterm review of that uh, uh, Skin Cancer Prevention Plan just published recently. Um, they do have some data on children's sun safety uh, behaviours and sunbed use in Northern Ireland. They're not com strictly comparable with the HBSC data set, but if anyone is interested in, in, in uh, finding those figures, we would be very happy to signpost people to the figures for Northern Ireland um, uh, if, you, if you let us know after the, uh, after the webinar. 
So um, I made a, a small error earlier in the uh, session with regards to the hashtag for this event. It's uh, hashtag teens UV report, not teen UV report. So um, I'll uh, put that up on the, on, on the screen in the, in the closing slides as well. But if any of you are engaging in the meantime, um, uh, just to clarify that that is the correct hashtag. Okay, so um, if we're okay now, I'm just going to check if we're okay to move into the panel Q&A. Okay, great. Um, I have, uh, we've had a, a nice rush of, of, of questions coming in. I won't be able to address all of them, but um, I, uh, I'm going to be posing questions uh, to each of the, the, the panelists. So if they could uh, unmute their microphones at this point to uh, get them, allow them to respond. Okay, so I have a, a question here uh, about the uh, data for you, Saoirse. Um, it's just a question about um, how reliable do you feel the data is around sunburns? Um, in the piloting, did children understand what sunburn was? Or could you talk us through a little bit about that self-reported sunburn measure? Sure. Um, yes, in the piloting, they definitely understood it. One of the things that we ask children to do, and we get them to answer questions during pilots, but then we talk them through the questions. And they, uh, before we do that, though, we ask them to underline any questions that they don't understand or any words that aren't clear to them. And there were no cases of, of not of indicating that they didn't understand the word sunburn uh, in this age group although there was in the younger age group where they weren't so clear. Um, but what we didn't do was check the severity of the sunburn, any implications of the sunburn, the circumstances around the sunburn, you know, how long they'd been in the sun, what kind of treatments they used or needed, which would have given further validation. And certainly, I think if we were intending to use these questions or similar questions to monitor the implementation of the study or of the... Um, the policy, it might be useful to do some more qualitative work with children around that particular specifically. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Saoirse. Um, another question here is around what do we know about attitudes or perceptions around tanning um, among children and teenagers in Ireland? So um, I'm going to just open this one up and maybe I'll, if Saoirse or Triana would like to comment on that, and then I'll maybe bring in Craig. So well, um, Helen, perhaps I'll come in there um, to say that I'm not aware of any data on okay. this particular topic in the in the Republic. Although we do know that, I, I think, and I think the report references it, that there's information that children in Northern Ireland um, think that a tan is healthy and desirable. Okay. Uh, Trina, do you have anything to add on, on that issue? I mean, just to say that it's a, it's an important one, I think, for when we do a consultation with young people, you know, I think that that's, that underlines a lot of the, the behaviours, you know, so, um, yes, we want, you know, we don't want people to get sunburned and we want them to reduce their overall UV exposure, but it's, it's, there's also that aspect of kind of deliberate UV exposure in order to get a tan, whether it's, you know, using a sunbed or, or sunbathing and, and to, you know, that's, um, that they, the desire to tan is something that we need to hiss, hiss hard, I think, and also to, to get that concept of that tanned skin is, is damaged skin as well. I think that's that look how we look at how we can choose that. But in terms of understanding at this moment in time, how how Irish young people um, understand that and believe that, I think it's it's um, something we don't know yet. And we yeah, need to I, um, um, the figures from the north were that I think 70% of school children didn't really understand the risks of tanning and more than half of them found that a tan was appealing um, and felt that it made them look quite healthy. So Craig, could you talk about children's perceptions around tanning and the experience yes, in Australia? Yes, um, In terms of adolescent uh, behaviour, so young people, the majority of adolescents no longer desire a tan. Um, it is less than, um, more adolescents desire a tan than, than adults, but the good news is the majority don't. And I think that's because of um, what's been drummed into them primary school, but also the desire, the fashion of a tan is is not as strong as it probably once was. And maybe they're all going off getting tattoos. I don't know. <laughs> but but um, yes, yeah, certainly the desire of a tan, the majority no longer desire a tan. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Craig. 
Um, uh, Trina, I have a question for you, um, uh, and perhaps Craig might like to come in on it. Um, could you talk to, talk us through a little bit around vitamin D requirements and exposure to children, exposure to sunshine and children? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is I think this is an important one because we know that vitamin D is you know it is an essential vitamin, and we want to make sure that children you know do to have enough vitamin D, but then it's that balance of you know that. Um, we don't want people to be deliberately, deliberately exposing their children to risky levels of, of, um, of UV rays, and, you know, thinking this is a good thing in order to get their vitamin D levels up. So there is very much a balancing act there. And again, it's, it's an issue in Ireland because of our climate, because we know for kind of half of the year, we don't have enough sunlight to make vitamin D anyway. So even if skin cancer wasn't an issue when UV risk wasn't, you wouldn't be able to get your vitamin D from sunlight. It would only be in the summer months. So for us, we would say it's very much about, you know, how you get it through nutrition and also that the fortification policy and, and supplementation policy in Ireland is, is a very important thing to, to look at how people get their vitamin D there. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's quite low levels of sort of instant, you know, when, they, when the UV index is high enough, it's actually just quite low levels of exposure are required and that you don't need to burn your skin, you know, and to have the child out for four hours with no skin protection in order to get vitamin D anyway. But I think rather than have that confusing message, I think, you know, bringing vitamin D back to, you know, getting it from a healthy diet and, you know, fortifying foods or supplementation in, in the very young, um, that that's the, the safest approach to take and that sort of deliberate um, skin exposure and damaging skin, thinking you're doing, you know, benefit of the child is, is something we want to sort of get out of the um, the conversation if we can, you know, but it is an important one. Okay, and thank you very much. Do you want to come in there, Craig? I'll, I'll just, I know Australia is a very different context, but um, we've thought about this a lot and the, and the measure that we've really considered is when the UV is greater than three, sun protection is required. When it's less, we actively discourage um, schools from enforcing no hat play in the shade. So we use the UV index to actively encourage sun protection, but also we, um, I think we're somewhat brave in also discouraging it when the UV levels are um, uh, less likely to cause, um, cause harm to, to, to the skin. So when it's less than three. Okay, great. Um, a lot of the questions we had come in seems to be on uh, on uh, aspects of the use of, of sunscreen. So, Trina, could you just reiterate what the recommendation is regarding sunscreen use in children? What SPF they should use? Sure. I mean, again, I suppose we're we're being quite conservative in Ireland in terms of saying you know fifty plus for children. So our general population recommendation is that children you know, that's that's sorry the population in general should use um, SPF of thirty and above you know, when, when mm -hmm. it's required and then 50 and above. Um, but also looking at the star rating because you need to look after UVA and, and UVB. Um, and then, you know, that's, 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 that it's how you use your sunscreen is probably the, the other thing that's, that's important to emphasize that personally, as we said a few times that it's, it should be the last resort. So, you know, having a child out in the midday sun in their, you know, swimwear for four hours and covering them in sunscreen isn't the best approach you know that it should be cover their skin you shade you know they'll use the other measures to stop the uv like hitting your skin in the first place use a hat sunglasses etc so it's it's putting sunscreen in in the in the right place is kind of a the last you know the last line of defense when there's no other way of stopping the uv light hitting your skin that's where sunscreen comes in but in terms of the, the type of sunscreen, that that's the SPF and ideally a five star rating and reapplying using it regularly um, so that it does, you know, it's, it's not going to, even if it says waterproof, for example, that you should mm -hmm. still reapply it after swimming or sweating, etc. It doesn't mean that it can't come off. It's just better at okay. with sun sweating. Um, and you just mentioned UVA and the, the star system in, in terms of the, the labeling that's on sunscreen products. We have a number of other European uh, countries representatives uh, at, uh, attending today. And uh, one of them has asked in the UK, they have the Boot Star system. Uh, five stars indicated that the UVA, UVA is, is at least 90%. Um, 
whereas they don't have that in other European countries. Do we have the star system here or should yeah, we have I didn't, it? Yeah, I didn't realise it was a boot specific system. My understanding is just a star rating, you know, okay. so one is for UVA and one is for, for UVB. So, you know, we, it, both okay. UVA and UVB can cause damage. So there are other types of UV rays, but they're the two that you want to um, want to filter out. So the star rating as well as your SPF are both important. Okay, great. Um, and also some concerns uh, raised in relation to um, the potential effect from chemicals within sunscreen. So um, I'll give you a little break, Katrina, and, and pose that one to Craig. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the, the bottom line is that the benefits that we know sunscreen provides um, is significant. We know it contributes to melanoma risk reduction. Um, so the, the chemicals that um, or nanoparticles or all these other attributes which are often critical uh, criticized in conjunction with sunscreen um, the impact of them is insignificant compared to the benefits and so I, I think it's really important we continue to reinforce sunscreen use um, we know based on numerous um, trials that it doesn't impact vitamin D levels when it, when it's used in environments when the UV is greater than three. Um, it is something that um, we we know works, and we should encourage people to use it and choose a sunscreen that they like cosmetically applying. I think that's the other key message that I often say is obviously it has to be an SPF 30, make sure it's got that broad spectrum protection. But um, whether it's uh, three quid or twenty or whatever euros um make sure it is cosmetically appealing because okay. you'll use more of it great great um so uh we have a question here as well about um when you're having a conversation uh with parents if you're working in a childcare setting or in clinical practice how do you balance the conversation when explaining the risk associated with sunburn in children when children may have been sunburned already so i guess this is a question about how do we move into a space that's encouraging and supportive of parents rather than potentially, you know, making them feel guilty or, or parental blame. Um, not all children, uh, particularly when they get to be teenagers, necessarily comply with their parents' wishes um, in, in regards to many things um, and risk taking included. So um, I suppose uh, the question is about um, how can we uh, support parents without um, in, in uh, blaming them? So does anyone want to take that question? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's something that applies to so many other lifestyle factors, yes. though, doesn't it? You know, it's the same, it's the same conversation across a lot of things. And I think for something like UV, you know, you also need to think it's it's sort of your lifetime exposure as well. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's um, you know, that's that we'll think about today and from here on, how can you how can you reduce your your, your child's exposure yeah. to harmful amounts of UV and not saying the damage is all done, you know, that's, yeah. um, and it is, it is, you, know, you, you, you want people to pay attention to a message, but you don't want to terrify them so much that, you know, they, they stop listening because, um, yeah. they become fatalistic either, you know, um, so it is very much about, well, you know, it's across your child's lifetime, you know, mm. repeated episodes of sunburn is bad or, you know, repeated, yeah. um, excessive exposure is bad. So what can you do from, from now and what are the changes that, you know, you can make, you know to your environment and, and your use of of these protective behaviors so okay. you know, i appreciate it's 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 a difficult one to, to balance so some of the other do you have any balance. any thoughts on that one Saoirse in terms of how can we get the balance between support and carrot and stick with parental behaviors and children's behaviors okay it, I, I think it's important to recognize it's not just carrot and stick it's opportunity access and so yeah. on that we need to include or, or improve and um Building on what Craig said during his presentation about the, the evidence is that the, it's the multi-component type models that have the best outcomes. So it's not just about intervening with um, individual parents or families or indeed individual children, but working across society in a way that the, the strategy has, has demonstrated, I think, uh, quite well, that we come at this from a range of different uh, perspectives. I think that's really important and, and over the longer term that it's about changing our culture around tanning, around sun exposure, about mm -hmm. making it unattractive to both 
children and parents um, and all the other players that are involved in supporting, encouraging and promoting child health. Okay, great. Um, which leads me nicely on to my next question. Um, it's a question for Craig. Uh, can you speak to what's been successful in Australia in reducing the appeal of a tan among, young, among children and young people? Is there one thing yeah, you can pinpoint or <laughs> is it many? Um, I, I think it is many. Uh, the, what we have done is delivered very hard hitting um, TV commercials which show the effect of melanoma um, metastasizing through the bloodstream. Um, they're, they're quite um, striking um, and we, we haven't held back in terms of delivering that very hard hitting messaging. Um, I think that's not necessarily the one thing that's shaping teenage behaviour, but I do think it recognises the seriousness of the issue and it means that the um, support structure around teenagers, whether it's parents, um, the school or peers, they're influenced by, by that broader education, um, recognising the seriousness of the issue. Okay, great. Um, one of the things um, that I think was raised as well was in relation to the way that the sunbed industry markets um, and uh, for children who were around in 1988 and children who were around in 2020, the, their exposure to multiple channels for that marketing of sunbed minutes and, and things like that um, is probably a little bit harder to manage now than it was mm. before yeah before um before the all those online channels um do we know anything about how the sunbed industry marketed to children and young people or to the general population in australia prior to their abolition a, a lot of it was around um product placement uh, in the sense that the the the, the the parlours, the, the sunbed operators were in areas where there were a lot of schools. Um, okay. they, they knew where to position themselves, um, offering strong um, price incentives to get people going back on multiple occasions. Um, there wasn't probably the same social media presence and use as there is at the moment, but they, they certainly were prolific around areas which had higher socioeconomic status generally, but also when there were lots, lots of schools and it was easy for teenagers to go in there. So we, we invested quite a lot on um, doing mystery shoppers, so actually sending in 17-year-olds um, mm -hmm. and, and assessing how many of them were getting through. And, and there was a self-regulatory code for sunbed operators, um, but we were able to pretty quickly show to government that that self-regulatory code was, was not in any way impactful, as most are. Right, okay. And did, was, there, was there, what was the level of sunbed use? Um, I'm not pulling you on a particular estimate, yeah, but was, yeah. it, was it around the same as we have? We've, we've uh, it's certainly it? higher. I mean, it was probably yeah. around three to five percent. Okay. Um, uh, when, when in, before they were banned in the under 18 bands, um, that under 18 band was impactful um, and it probably dropped to the type of level that you've got at the moment as you also yeah. have that under 18 band. But before then it would have been yeah, up around 5%, but not too dissimilar to nice. what um, you're experiencing now at the moment. Okay, okay. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, I have a question about the Healthy Ireland SunSmart code. Um, it's a question about how the order was decided um, is this the order of behaviour that should be used or uh, is there something that we can do in terms of the order in which things are presented to make, uh, to make it more clear that it's not sunscreen only or it's not one behaviour only or how, 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 does that, how can we get that message across when we have a, a static code, I think is the question. I'm paraphrasing a little there. So I'll maybe pass that one on to, to Trina. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting one because from looking at, you know, 
what levels at which the different behaviours are followed in children. I think it's clear that, you know, the order in which we have them isn't necessarily the ones that we would need to focus on most. So um, currently it's not, not meant to be in any order of importance, but I think it would be useful in, in working with children and young people as to whether that would have an impact or whether um, whether the code as itself makes a difference or whether we just need to maybe have focused efforts on particular aspects of it to, to highlight why they're important or to, um, again, maybe tackle it. So say, for example, seeking shade, that's one that you very much can tackle through the environment and making it available. So it can be sort of a two prong thing that it's part of the code, but also working with schools and parks and other settings to make sure that that's available. So um, no, it's interesting because it's not, it's definitely not meant to be an, an order in which, an order of priority. You know, everything there is is of, of equal importance, but definitely from what we've looked at today um, you know the the levels at which they're being met are different so it's definitely one to work on. Okay great um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. just about the order I noticed that too and I thought it was really interesting mm -hmm. and I think the order it's presented it is similar to similar campaigns the order is similar to that of other countries but it might be worth revisiting actually and um, for future campaigns because we really should have I would imagine, and it'd be really interesting to talk to children about this. If if sunscreen is the last resort, then perhaps it would be better to have that at the bottom. But there are other factors I think that might um, determine appropriate hierarchy, and that could be around cost for families and for children, uh, but also environmental impact. So I'm kind of aware that you know sunscreen comes in plastic bottles and so on, whereas shade in general in Ireland is is relatively free certainly doesn't cost the family that much. So there may be a whole range of different um, elements or attributes of a particular action that could be taken into consideration. But I want to link it also to what Craig said about the hard-hitting media campaigns, because the, the hard-hitting media campaigns can work, but they work especially when there are alternative positive behaviours presented alongside them. So this is awful, but, it, but this is what you can do instead. And, and those two elements of the campaign need to be, go alongside one another more generally in, in health promotion campaigns. So support, yeah. obviously, that approach, but um, it'd be interesting to see what children say about it themselves. Yeah, I, I guess that's about showing and modelling the, the behaviours. And, and I think with the regulations, they sort of normalise them. So if, if every child in the school has to wear a hat and sunscreen, then it's you know, it's, it becomes normalised, I guess, quite quickly. One of the uh, points that you raised there was in, in relation to cost. Um, so I just in terms of a, a question for Craig, in what way has Australia uh, introduced sort of financial incentives around things like taxation of sunscreen or things like that to support making these measures low cost or has that happened? Beyond the it being tax free, there's there's no other. Um, the the point that um, the Cancer Society, where I work, so similar to the Irish mm -hmm. Cancer Society, have been really strong on is is just going back to the point about making finding a product that you're um, comfortable in applying and don't be too fussed about um, chasing what brand so those generic brands that are in um, major supermarkets which are significantly cheaper than others um, is is one way where you can um, obviously cut the cost of um, your purchase but you're more than likely going to be getting a product that's going to be equally as good as those that are more expensive um, in general terms um, bearing in mind taking into account the star rating and um, the SPFs, of course. But yes, choose a product that you like applying and whether, whether it's cheap or expensive, um, go for it. So I think the, the most uh, impactful part about sunscreen in price has been getting the major supermarket chains in there buying and selling them in bulk and getting that price down. Okay, okay, that's really interesting around how the, the you can, <laughs> you could almost change the market around availability and price competition yes. between the big yep. supermarkets. Okay. That's yeah. right. Being tax free uh, helps, but I yeah. think the market force is actually bigger. Okay. Okay. And in terms of the, the, um, on another aspect of marketing in relation to the marketing of sunbed minutes, 
um, what was the practice in that in in Australia? Um, is it what you had you had touched on that around getting a discount, or is it like buy three sessions, get a fifth, fourth, or fifth free? It was that the form of cost based promotion that was being yes. used. Yes, correct. That that was the the primary method, okay. and so it was really rewarding repeat customers, and, and that is clearly not healthy. And um, people were going on a daily basis and trying to maximise their value. There was some that was sort of unlimited over a period of a month, and you know that okay. you can know what that would mean. Um, <laughs> so, so. Yeah, moving away from that, I think it's an important bit of restriction that we should look at where, where under 18 or where some beds are still in use. Okay, and where we have um, uh, some beds co-located with, uh, for example, um, beauty salons or things like that, where there's sort of cross-marketing between the two, the two services, did you experience that kind of model as well? Yeah, so what um, what happened in uh, Australia is that they end up, before the ban took effect, there, there was a, a licensing, all Sunbed operators had to be licensed. So there was a fee attached with that. So that may have um, meant that some of them were required that just didn't think it was worth paying the fee, so they stopped doing it. Um, and the other thing was that all sunbeds, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the case in Ireland, also have to be supervised. So at least it got rid of those in gymnasiums, um, ho hotels, where they were more coin slot and there was no supervision was there. So I think that was also an important measure that made a big difference in reducing the, the numbers of them. Okay, great. Um, I think that is uh, all the questions uh, that have come in. I think uh, we've had one or two questions around uh, cross-border cooperation, European cooperation, global cooperation. Um, so I might just, uh, obviously, Saoirse, the HBSC is, a, uh, is, in, uh, is in the, all the OECD countries, am I right, or some of them? Um, what do you think this means for, do you think, other HPSC countries might now be interested in, in, in monitoring this data. Could we move to a European comparison on this data? Um, well, to my knowledge, I don't think any other countries are currently doing this, but um, I, from my conversations with, with researchers at our recent meeting, I think there is an appetite to look at this. Mm -hmm. We need to pin down the items, do the extra um, research, I think, on the items that we, I, I mentioned earlier and um, consult with you, but also uh, European cancer control um, bodies to make sure that what we're asking is going to be relevant, useful, interpretable by children, but also useful for policy. But I think uh, there would be certainly an, an appetite yeah. to include these items or, or something similar. Okay, great. Katrina, do you have any thoughts in relation to cross-border cooperation, European global cooperation, where we maybe need to go on, on, on that, um, in cancer prevention? Definitely in terms of sunbed use and any move to, you know, to, to change the regulations there, I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussions across countries and interested charities in, in Europe on that. So yeah, there's quite a lot of those discussions ongoing. Um, the other areas, I suppose, of, of UV protection, less less so in terms of the, the behaviour change and the policies within your own education systems. I suppose it's more learning from each other there, but from, um, from the more regulatory point of view, I think some beds would be the one where there's the biggest opportunity at an EU level for sure. Great. Okay. Uh, do you have any comments on that, Craig? What have you gained from the uh, global? Um, yes. Well, from a WHO perspective and being involved in the development of um, guidelines and policy for them, I mean, certainly from what I understand within the Irish context, that there is the capacity, even though it's been part of the EU, to institute laws um, that are able to ban sunbeds, but um, I'm, I'm certainly no EU expert, but that was my understanding that, that, that because of the public health benefit that that opportunity um, is, is there, but uh, I, I think that's worth pursuing. Okay, great. Um, 
Well, I think I have gone through uh, nearly all of the questions that were uh, submitted and I think we've had a very good uh, discussion on those. So I'm now going to uh, move along to just give some uh, closing remarks, uh, which involves me sharing my screen. Um, just give me one moment. Okay, I'm just going to go back here for a second. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, thank all of the parties who shared data with us in this report. Um, principally, uh, Saoirse and her team, Andras and the team in, in Galway for the, from the Health Behaviour and School Age Children Survey, but also from the data that we got from um, Met Erin and the, the German Weather Service, who I we had occasion to engage with, and uh, the uh, Growing Up in Ireland data set, uh, the Young Persons Behaviour and Attitude Survey run by the Northern Ireland Statistical Research Agency, the National Cancer Registry of Ireland and so on. So um, just wanted to, to thank them. First, I'd like to thank all my team uh, in uh, uh, Institute of Public Health. This is our first webinar, so uh, I think we've done really, really well, uh, particularly for all the support on communications and IT and getting the report over the line. And a very, very special thanks for Lauren Rodriguez, who really led on pushing this full report through from beginning to end. And she would have been the one engaging with lots of different people across lots of different aspects. She's been really, really brilliant. Um, Thank you also to Trina and Anya Ling in the National Cancer Control Programme. It's been a pleasure working with you on this report and I look forward to uh, supporting the implementation further and to Craig for providing his expert input and being so generous with his time so late at night in, <laughs> in Australia. Um, this is a reminder of our, our hashtag for people hoping to engage with us on social media. We, we welcome your engagement and questions um, on, on the report and uh, here is a link to the, uh, this is a QR code for the uh, report and it is available on our, our website, which is publichealth.ie. Um, so uh, with all of that said, I am now going to close our webinar. Thank you to all our attendees. We had attendees from uh, lots of different European countries. I think we had attendees from the States and uh, quite a global group, as well as uh, lots of our local uh, partners in Ireland and Northern Ireland. So it's been um, it's been really fantastic to see the level of engagement. I do hope you've enjoyed the um, webinar and found it useful. Um, if you did, tell us in the evaluation form. If you didn't, tell us in the evaluation form. <laughs> it will be sent out to you, um, all attendees, and then everyone who registered will get that in due course. We have a, a link to the report and the evaluation form, and any information relating to CPG will be issued to you by email. So uh, with that in mind, uh, thank you again to uh, the speakers and to all the team who put this together, and I'm going to close the